Okay, we can now see participants coming through. Hello everyone, welcome. Happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Thank you for joining us for today's roundtable, uh, learning from lived experience, overcoming barriers to digital inclusion. My name is Matt, and I am one of the directors and co-founders at Cyberduck, and I'm going to be your host for this session. Cyberduck are a user experience and technology-focused digital transformation agency, and we strive for every experience we create to be inclusive and accessible because we believe not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also good for business. So with that in mind, my pronouns are he and him. I'm a white man with glasses and short dark hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and a light green overshirt. Before we start, uh, a little bit of housekeeping from me. Um, we've been joined by uh, Carol Spencer and Gemma Mazza, who are BSL interpreters. So if you need to, you can pin them to your screen by clicking on the three dots on their video and selecting pin to screen. Live captioning is also being provided for this event. Um, if it hasn't automatically been turned on for you, you can switch this on using the live transcript button located at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitle. We're also recording this session and everyone who has signed up will receive an email next week, providing them access to the on-demand video version of the session. So now on to the session itself. Uh, in today's round table, we're exploring usability uh, barriers, accessibility challenges, and solutions to digital exclusion. Specifically, how do we achieve good universal design and usability? When we're designing services and products with inclusion and accessibility in mind, there are now a variety of guidelines and policies like uh, WCAG, ADA, the Equality Act, and, and the upcoming European Accessibility Act. And while these are all fantastic tools, do they actually go far enough? Often it seems mere compliance is the main goal. And if we want to achieve universal design that actually provides a great experience to the billions of people with disabilities, surely we need to go further than that. So um, what's clear to me is that inclusion and accessibility theory and checklist guidance are no replacement for real life insights and experience. So to help us navigate this specific topic, I have here today with me a brilliant panel of UX accessibility and inclusion experts. And they're each gonna bring their own unique perspectives from their lived experiences and how their own disability impacts how they interact with digital technologies and what we can all learn from it to make more inclusive services. Before I introduce our panelists, um, those of you who have joined our previous webinars and roundtables will know that in these roundtables, we like to get you, as in the audience, involved. So if you have a question you'd like me to put to the panel, please pop it into the chat and I will do my best to make sure that we ask it. Any questions that we don't manage to cover in the time that we have today, we'll do our best to collate and get a blog post out in the near future. So now onwards to our fantastic panelists who I can see now are all here. So we have Yai Siad, who is the diversity and accessibility lead at Cyberduck. Siobhan Daly, who is a visual and UI designer at Cyberduck. We have Sandy Wasma, a long-term friend of Cyberduck and CEO at the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion. And we also have Holly Schroeder, a previous panelist uh, on our accessibility roundtables, who, who's come back for more uh, and is a UX researcher and designer specializing in medtech. So I'd like to start with Yai, if you could please tell us a little bit more about yourself in one to two minutes and why this topic is something that really matters to you. So starting with yourself, Yai. Hi, good afternoon all. Um, yeah, so my name is Yahya Siad. I'm, um, I'm the Diversity Accessibility Lead at CyberDuck. Um, I've been involved, obviously, in everything to do with accessibility inclusion professionally for the last um, 10 to 12 years, but I, always, I would like to say 38 years because it is something that uh, uh, lives with me day in, day out. Um, why it's so important to me? Again, I think it's 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 precisely for the for the purpose of our session today. Um, often uh, the design of the solutions for accessibility and, um, and, and, and disability design, um, or just just in general inclusive design, uh, are done with are done with a good intention, but with lack of consultation with us. And and I and I really took it on myself to be a part of this to make sure that whatever is getting designed um, or made are genuinely accessible um, from with, with our inputs. If that if that makes sense, uh, as somebody who was uh, born uh, with visual impairment. Thank you, Yai. Over to you, Siobhan. 
Hello, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Siobhan. I'm a user interface designer here at Cyberduck. Um, and I myself have dyslexia. So I'll be chatting a little bit about my personal experiences coming from a professional creative background uh, with dyslexia. Um, so I'm also, I'm a black woman. Uh, and my pronouns are she and her. And yeah, so I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about my experiences um, coming, yeah, coming from a creative background and designing for all, uh, designing for um, inclusivity and making making uh, the digital products and services accessible for everyone. And uh, thanks, Siobhan. And over to you, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Wasmer, and um, so my I, I guess I would say that I'm a human rights activist at my heart and everything I think about around inclusion and accessibility and equality and diversity and all of the things that. Um, I spend every day worrying about. Uh, I take it from the idea that we're all human beings here on this earth, just trying to get on with our lives and doing the best that we can. And really on the core principle that all human beings are equally human and that no human being is more or less human than any other. So we all have you know, equal weight in terms of how we're able to navigate the world. Um, from my personal experience, I uh, registered blind in, back in 2008 and I was diagnosed with ADHD in 2009. So I live with two somewhat conflicting disabilities, but I just get on with it. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't work in technology now. I'm, I'm chief executive of a, of a uh, d uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion uh, membership and training consultancy organization. But uh, for many years, I did run a digital agency and we also specialized in accessibility and inclusive design. So this is something that's really close to my heart, which is I guess why I've stayed in contact with Matt and Cyberduck for so many years. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thanks, Sandy. It's great to have you here as well. Over to you, Holly. Oh, hi. So my name's Holly Schroeder. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a senior experience research, user experience researcher and accessibility consultant. I work in med tech, um, specifically in the cardiovascular health space. Um, I'm a disabled white woman with olive skin, dark brown eyes, long straight dark brown hair, and I'm wearing a skinny black and white striped shirt. Um, I'm hard of hearing. You might have caught me putting in my hearing aids. I was thinking while uh, someone was talking, I was like, why can't I hear? Oh, yeah, I have to put in the hearing aids. Those help. Um, and I had brain surgery last year. I have a degenerative brain disease that causes um, tremors and a movement disorder. And I've got ADHD and I have more neurologists than is probably a fair share. So I have quite a few disabilities that um, impact my day every day. And I'm really passionate about making the world as, close, as inclusive as we can in physical and in digital space. Thanks, Holly. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I think the first question really has to be, Obviously, each of you has, has, has described um, the disabilities that you have and what those experiences mean in the digital world. So what are the main barriers that you face as a disabled person when using digital products or on, online services? Who, who wants to come in first here? Perhaps Holly, you as, you, as you were the last to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Well, for, um, I, well, thanks to, the lovely process of aging and puberty in reverse, otherwise known as menopause, I now get visually triggered vestibular migraines. So motion on screen can really, I mean, and we're not talking like, oh gosh, I have a little headache. Like people want to call an ambulance for me. I get so sick. It's vertigo, nausea, flop sweating. Like I had I didn't even know that's what a migraine was, honestly. I thought it was something else. Um, and so that is probably the thing that I have to be very careful when I'm consuming content that it, it that, that like TikTok, if somebody sends me a video, I can go watch it, but I can't just browse through the videos. It's even with it not auto 
starting, just the motion of it looping through all those visuals will trigger a, a migraine that'll knock me out for a few days. Um, also with the tremors before I had surgery, sometimes I had to be a keyboard only user because my tremors are so severe that I wouldn't be able to use my mouse. I have what's called postural and intentional tremors and intentional tremors. The closer you get to your target, the worse your tremor gets. And now that I've had surgery, it's much better. Um, whereas like with Parkinson's, they're typically postural tremors where it's at rest. So I have both, um, but the postural or intentional tremors in my hand are much better. Password masking is another one because of my ADHD and some other short-term memory issues. I got locked out of accounts, I don't know, a couple, few times a week. Those are probably my three big ones. Yeah, no, and I, let's maybe dig into those a little bit more because I think that's, that's really interesting. Should we go to, to you next, Sandy? Sure. Um, so I, I, I feel much more straightforward than Holly. Um, my, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm blind and I'm a screen reader user. And, uh, you know, the wide variety of websites that, um, that work with my screen reader. I mean, some websites, not at all. Some websites are fantastic, apps, whatever, any sort of digital products. Um, it, you know, being accessible to my screen reader is really important, but it's not just about whatever is going on on screen being exposed to my screen reader. It's also about the, you know, semantic structure of a website. So as I'm reading my screen reader, having it make sense to where I am on the site, where I'm going or what I'm doing, same with apps. Um, you know, so, so really being screen reader accessible is key and lots of, you know, irritating things like pop-ups and overlays that aren't accessible. I can't find where to close them. I, you know, I just navigate off, off, off websites or navigate off things. Um, similar to Holly with passwords. Yeah, that's just, you know, oh, 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 always a bit of a nightmare. Um, you know, so I've got, I've got a, you know, a, a password wallet piece of software but by the time I get back to whatever the app or the website is I usually forget what it is as well so that happens quite a lot um, and with the ADHD then that's more nuanced that's more about the way information is conveyed so if I'm trying to find some information you know how that information is structured does it have a good heading structure are there bullet points you know how is the information conveyed so i can understand what's on a page so i love things like when when like a page or 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 you know or a screen is it, you know it says okay well on this page is blah 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 and then you have, and then you link to the different sections that's really sometimes really helpful so it's also really important how information is conveyed so that i can understand you know what i'm getting into and what's available and also, you know, and a lot of this is to do with the with the accessibility of writing. Like sometimes I'm reading things, and I'm like, oh, what is the point? Like, are they just going to get to the point? Can someone tell me what this article is actually about? And that sort of thing. So a lot of stuff around ADHD is around um, the the ability to take information in, to store information in, you know, my short term memory as I'm reading through an article to understand other relevant things. So really important how information is conveyed and chunked to me. So having information in good chunks with good titles and good sections that really helps. So uh, those are my main, my, my main challenges. Yeah, is that, is that ex exacerbated somewhat by also using a screen reader? So if it's big blocks of text, does it make it harder to, to read it? Well, yeah, sometimes because, it, so if let's say, for example, you have a website that's not particularly well-structured plus lots of blah, blah content. Yeah, I, I just, I go away. I just, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's really like challenging. the recipe with the story the story before the recipe yeah, with no yeah. jump link right yeah mm. yeah it's like look like blah 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 i just wanted the recipe yeah exactly that's a perfect example holly but i think also because so much stuff for people with adhd are visual cues so i'm kind of screwed in that direction uh you know so so it, again it's like it's how information is chunked and so that i can manage how i consume it because i can't visually scan things Mm. Uh, you know, so yeah, it, it's kind of a double challenge when when things aren't well stru well structured or well written. That's that's a really important point. <laughs> and Siobhan, I, I imagine as someone with dyslexia, that's something that you relate to as well, at least from the structuring of information. Oh, ab absolutely, yeah. I feel uh, very similar to you, Sandy, in that regards. 
um, when I see a great big block of text, it's, <laughs> I run, it scares me almost. Um, so yeah, structure is really important um, and making that, that text, uh, that information just digestible, um, mm -hmm. just being able to pick out key points. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> As, as somebody who is dyslexic, what it, what is it like, like trying to read, like, you know, if I guess if I guess because it's font choice, it's the length of the text complexity, it, like, what, what, what is that like? For me personally, when I see a great big uh, chunk of text, words will often uh, merge together or flicker. It's really difficult to to read a great big chunk of text. I need it broken out into into paragraphs short um, short short but sweet paragraphs mm -hmm. and I remember growing up uh, I act, would actively avoid reading for this exact reason um, it's only later on in life that I um, sort of developed the love of books and the love of reading because it would scare me when I would see great big chunks of uh, text um, so yeah very very similar experience to you Sandy very very ex uh, similar experience I need um, I need content to be digestible and thanks, Siobhan. And, and Yoyi, what about yourself? Yeah, sure. So building, I think, from, from what they said, um, I think it's very important kind of just to bring the picture closer to the audience to mm. understand that there is really no difference between the physical world of accessibility and digital world of accessibility. And what, what I mean by that, for me, what's important is the sense of familiarity and sense of, as you guys mentioned, the proper structure. So let's imagine I'm walking to a um, superstore uh, mm. to buy some, to buy some, to do some shopping for it, like a grocery shopping. I, in my head, I will memorize that on the right is I don't know the vegetable fruit. On the left is the customer service, straightforward. I don't know. Second aisle is where the I don't know the pasta and rice, etc. So I I have a clarity, right? I'm not able to see where things are, but I have a kind of a spatial memory in my head to know where the things are. Now in the digital world, it's I kind of I kind of operate the same thing. So I go to a website, I expect, for example, I don't know um, about us to be on the top. So then I bring the links up by using keyboard shortcuts. Um, so I don't use mouse; I use keyboard and screen reader uh, in all devices, whether it's um, I, um, iOS um, or Androids or Windows. So then, what 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 confuses me and what makes it difficult for me is that the the structures are not are not clear. Um, as you guys mentioned, there's too many things on the way. Sometimes you see too many advertisements and, and, and kind of promotion of things, and it gets into the way of what I'm trying to do. So I think having that kind of a sequence of familiarity where things are um, by bringing elements um, um, or headings or uh, um, et cetera, it really helps for me to navigate um, and, 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 that's, and that's a very key. So because the, the screen reader reads vertically rather than horizontally. So it goes like a column from, from the top left, it goes down, then it goes to the second one, et cetera. So that's really, it's important to have a clean semantic kind of coding into the website for, for, for my screen reader to interact very well with it. Okay. And are there, there are common things that you come across like cookie notices or things like that, that, that break that semantic order? In my experience, yes, because um, unless uh, with, with the cookies, that's a very common one thing actually. As long as at, uh, until you until you kind of accept the cookies, you're not going to get the same experience. So it definitely always gets on the way to start with. So, cookie notices are kind of bad, I guess, usability for lots of reasons. <laughs> you know, for they they're good from a guess perspective, could be able to control your data when they're done well, but. It, from I guess from an accessibility point of view, it, it perhaps breaks that experience as well, if, especially if it's it's not in the right order semantically. Yeah, uh, I would say so, and I think it, it could be it could be anything. It could be a commercial um, like a flyers kind of advert. It could be it could be anything really. So as long as the, the, the simplicity here, I think, is key. The the more simple you make in the structure. If I need something, I will look for it. And I, and I would appreciate not to have too many things on my way getting into what I'm trying to achieve. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other examples of, of that sort of thing? Like you said, popovers and, and things like that. Are there any other examples that, that, that all of you face that, you, that are common things that 
if websites just stopped doing it or you know companies stopped doing it it would just make you, your lives better um i'd say stop trying to squeeze every single word in <laughs> uh pinpoint exactly what you want to say um be yeah be direct with what you want to say you don't need to put mountains of text um so yeah and that and consistency from me personally i think also to using good uh clean fonts atkinson hyper legible is a fantastic font it's dyslexia friendly what makes it a great font is that each individual character is distinct so you can tell the difference between a zero and the letter o at a glance without having to guess and i have um i have difficulty with uh like I forgot what it's called, but like a number dyslexia. It's a, so where I'll switch around numbers instead of letters. My mom has uh, reading dyslexia. I don't know what the exact names of it. I'm like, I have so many things I <laughs> quit counting. Um, but she was essentially functionally illiterate until she was in middle school. They moved around a lot, uh, sort of not a military family, but her dad worked for a military school system and she just kind of got passed through the system and it wasn't until middle school that she was identified as dyslexic and i think my brother has it also and so for me even though i don't have the difficulty with letters that i do with numbers so as a researcher i quadruple check all my math and usually if i can leave it and come back you know to make sure um that there's no errors always peer check everything just because that's a great idea uh but with the the text and the bullets if i get a big block of text the first thing i do is dump it into a new document and read it and break it into bullets as i read it because my brain just shuts down when i, do I see that that much text in, in one place or that much stuff there's a company here in the u.s called harbor freight it's like i don't know they sell tools and hardware stuff i always think about their ads it's just like a gallery of a million tools and text photos and it, that is like my absolute worst nightmare like if i encountered that page i would immediately navigate away i would have probably run away that is the most awful thing a friend um sometimes i use the developer inspector tool to turn off stuff to reduce distractions on the page that's, that's really interesting I, I saw recently we we use a tool called slack a lot at work mm -hmm. um and i saw recently slack introduced some tools where you can turn like you can turn off animated gifs by default so if somebody, if anybody's ever used Slack, they'll kind of know what it's about. It's quite, I guess, similar to any instant messaging service in the sense that it's usually full of GIFs and it's usually full of emojis and the emojis animate and all of that kind of thing. And I mean, as somebody who's, who's not disabled, I, you know, I don't have dyslexia. I personally find that very distracting. Mm. You know, if I'm trying to read something and there's things constantly moving around while I'm trying to read. So should I mean I guess should websites kind of avoid animated stuff that animates by default but or like also give the controls to people to turn off it those things should always be in control of the user and should be off by default in my opinion you should always have the choice hmm. whether you want to turn it on or not I mean for me with the visually triggered vestibular migraines migrating to a website ironically the Microsoft inclusion uh website used to have a really large animation on the website and i couldn't use their website because of it they fixed it since but if i encounter something like that it can literally make me sick and that is one of the guidelines is to always give the user control freedom and control and also um you know like jacob's law you were talking about how when you're in the grocery store, you have sort of a mind map of where things are. We have that with websites too. So if you're going to, you know, change a convention, 
please have a really good reason for it. And being cute is not a good reason because cute usability trumps cute every time. Like you might think you're being cute and clever, but you've now excluded a huge group of mm. people from being able to use your service. I mean, Holly, it, you know, for me, so I'm, I, I don't use a, a regular computer. I'm an iPad user and that's my main computer. So I, I have very limited vision, but I, I, so I use touch. And so if I go on a website and I expect the, you know, home button to be on the left, you know, search to be on the right at top and so on. So those conventions are absolutely vital for me because it's how I, I navigate. If I, you know, start moving around a website and things are, as you say, cute in, uh, in different locations, I just give up. So those conventions I think are now fairly established uh, and, and need, just need to be adhered to. Um, you know, that, and also I wanna say something else about what Holly said about choice because you know it's the same as you know in the old days when videos used to just play on websites it's the same sort of thing with with, with animations i think that people need choice and control that's mm. really really it's a really important tenet of, of, of inclusion at all does that does that apply to um quite often on websites you have um i have personal views on carousels uh <laughs> just from a content side of things not not necessarily an accessibility side of things but like carousels that animate sure is that the same sort of thing is that like yep yeah yeah I mean, look, I, you know, what the guidelines say for me is, 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 is by the by. I think that, you know, you can have a carousel, which has a button that says next slide or whatever. Perfect. It's giving, it's putting the, the user in control. That, that feels right from an inclusion point of view, mm. you know, in terms of philosophically, that's right. And it's a basic heuristic user freedom and control. Like yeah. if you're a user experience designer or researcher this should be in your toolkit yeah. you know if you're thinking about the heuristics of what you're working on user freedom and control providing an exit you know that's another really frustrating thing i know if people are putting things where they think it's going to be clever instead of what's common you know well i'm going to make the home or the hamburger menu look different i'm gonna or i'm not gonna put uh text labels with my icons or you know you start doing those things and it really monkeys with people's experience um and it can make it quite quite challenging and why for why what's the point mm. yeah We've got some really good uh, questions in, in in the chat that I'd like to, to go um, through if, if we can. Uh, the first is, um, Holly, you, you raised the, the point about password solutions. I think every everyone, you know, usability of password solutions is, is something that affects everyone, but particularly um, as a painful problem for yourself, uh, Holly, do you, do you mind sort of explaining that in a little bit more detail, maybe to point us towards like, what, what does good look like? Um, for you know password solutions. That looks like I have the I have user freedom and control to reveal my password. You know, it goes back to those basic heuristics. Are you providing the user control? And I think if it's my web experience, I want control over it, whether it's motion or my password. And let's be for real, how often is someone leaning over my shoulder? where it would even be necessary for me to mask my password very rarely you know so to me it's a little ridiculous that the default is to conceal it i think that the most situations people don't need that and don't want that and it, because i have working memory issues you know i've had multiple TBIs, I have ADHD, and I have an auditory processing disorder. So which one's responsible for my crappy working memory? Who knows? But I will forget what I typed as soon as I typed it. And as you know, if you mistype your password a few times, then you're locked out. And then I have to go through, it's like a 10 minute long ordeal. Mm. And then I might botch it again, mm. because the password masking is still there, you know, and it's like, oh, did I remember to write it down? Did I, how do I know if I even typed it? Did I type it in caps or in upper and lower? I mean, it just, 
the cognitive load is overwhelming and it makes me not want to use things that don't that even with a password manager mm -hmm. it's still sometimes it's not on for some reason or who knows yeah. it is the most persistent annoying and it's more than annoying you know if i add up the time that i spend resetting passwords in a week I don't even want to consider what that ends up looking like in a year. I could probably take two days of vacation. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's it. I think, like you said, there that there's also. I'd, I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on what what are good accessible password managers. But um, I think obviously with some sites, if they don't tag the input field for the password correctly in the code, the, the, even if you have a password manager, it won't it won't bring it up. But I guess going back to that with the passwords, like, is there a good sort of password management tool? And I guess for you, Yai and Sandy, like, how how does entering passwords and using password managers work with screen readers? I don't, yeah, I don't. I I don't use it. I, I I haven't found one that works yet. So any suggestions would be most welcome. Right. And so I just use this. I don't know. It's really old. I, I I don't even know if it's properly supported anymore. I use something called Wallet, and I literally just type a password into it. I pick up the password from 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 Wallet, and I and I you know either remember it or pop it in to uh, yeah. It's not great, and I don't use anything like One Password or any of those. I've just I found they they work sometimes. They don't work other times, and there's just too many variables. So I'd rather, I, so for me, I don't use the password manager because at least I have like my passwords safely secure somewhere and I just take them when I need them. Cause that mm -hmm. seems to be like, I feel more in control but I'd love to use password manager. The only other thing that works sometimes is, um, is with, uh, with my iPad because some passwords will recognize um, you know, my touch ID. So I can I can go in and put in my my email and then the touch ID recognizes it, but I have actually no idea why that works in some instances and it doesn't in other, others. I think for me, um, just to show the varieties of of experience for, from different people, um, I don't have luckily I have got really detailed memory that I'm blessed with. Like now, even if you give me a credit card number, I'll just memorize it in one go. So I never have a problem with that. My problem really, when it comes to kind of inputting information, it's it's around, uh, you know, when you go to websites and it tells you um, um, uh, visual challenge, uh, you know, how many pictures have a, I don't know, a cycle, a bicycle on them or lorry oh. on them, uh, et cetera. So oh, yeah. I, I, I do appreciate, appreciate, and I do like those websites who have the good practice is to have a multiple choices of, how to verify you as a human, obviously. So, um, you know, audio challenge, uh, you know, really just varieties of something that my either, either myself or Holly or, or Siobhan or uh, Sandy can, with, the, with, with our differences, able to input uh, the yeah. information. So for me, this, this is the biggest challenge, but like in the past, it's, it's never an issue for me. Thank yeah. you for reminding me how much I hate CAPTCHAs. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think uh, that somebody put that in the chat actually, and they, and they put even about disabilities. You know those captures where you select every image that has a bus. Uh, it's with these tiny, grainy, unclear images. It's it's an absolute nightmare. So it, I think that's a really good point, Yai, which is give people different options. You know that's how you make make it more accessible. Is give different ways to. I understand websites need to verify that you're a human, but like give people different ways of doing that perhaps rather than, and you know, I'd probably choose one of those other options as well. You know, it's sometimes very hard to figure out, you know, what's the traffic light in those images, especially well, when it's right. I'm always like, where, where does the traffic light begin and end according to their rule, you yeah. know? Um, exactly. And now they have a new one, which I'm like, I guess they just hate everyone who has movement disorders where you drag a puzzle piece to complete a puzzle. I was like this, I wouldn't have been able to do that before my brain surgery. It would have been literally impossible. And it was the only option. Hmm. Somebody in the chat's raised a good point regarding passwords. Somebody mentioned one password as, as, a, as an app that, that they recommend, but somebody also mentioned, and I've, I've seen websites do this, uh, more recently, I, um, 
my energy company, which uh, unfortunately they're not doing too well right now, like many energy companies, I guess, in the UK. But uh, they to log in, they give you they give you the option of entering a password or um, email you a magic link or like a one time code. Uh, and I, I don't is that is having again is it, having the options is that is that good is that not good? I think choice is always a great idea. I mean, it might not work great for us on the panel, but it might work really well for someone else. I, it would be great if it was possible to have something that's 100% accessible. That would be amazing. But the truth is there that's impossible because the spectrum of disability is so broad and complex that doesn't mean we shouldn't try mm. but there's always going to be some situation or something that doesn't work as well for one person as it does for another and it stinks but you know it's unavoidable. I, i'm all for the magic wand yeah it's unavoidable but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try our best to provide as many choices and as many um include as many things as we possibly can that kind of raises an interesting question potentially and maybe maybe it does maybe it doesn't but um <clears throat> regarding sort of i mean obviously there can't be a one-size-fits-all approach but is there a risk that sometimes doing something that that works well for one type of disability actually degrades the experience for other people with another type of disability the one and it, the the question in the chat reminded me of this is one around uh, color contrast so obviously improving color contrast improves the experience for lots of people with lots of types of disabilities but also if you have certain types of contrasting colors uh, Siobhan this might be something you've experienced it can actually make things hard to read and actually having too much contrast is actually can actually be uh, or certain types of colors can actually be degrade the experience yeah 100 percent. unfortunately yeah it is unavoidable there is no silver bullet really um there is no way to design for everyone but like holly said um that doesn't mean you shouldn't try um so for example people with like uh, low literacy benefit from infographics while uh neurodivergent people um prefer plain text and <laughs> those are quite uh, those are very uh, different approaches to content um so the only way is really to provide provide both. And with regard to colours, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's about finding the balance, I suppose, finding the balance between um, usability, accessibility and aesthetics. Um, mm -hmm. Like we say, you're never going get, to get it 100 percent. But I suppose for user testing, just all I can say is test, test, test. Um, the more people you can get to test the, the design, the website, the better. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah, and I think it's important. Yeah, it's quite important here also to stress the idea of, um, as you said, you're never gonna get it right. Um, and this is something about the, why I call it the, the maintenance of continuous um, accessibility. Sometimes we design things um, in accessible way, and we th and we leave it that way, right? Mm -hmm. We don't realize like over the time how appropriate it is, how functional it is, uh, you know, is 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 it still relevant with 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 different users? And and mm -hmm. it, it gets it gets forgotten. I mean, I I use uh, apps sometimes. One of them, one of the apps I use is for travel, and it's really really accessible. And I was so happy, and I was about even so happy. Of, I was about to go and write a review about it, how, how, how accessible it was, until the latest version have removed some of those most accessible options, uh, which to start with, which is, which is the search field. So, and I'm sure the intention was not to make it inaccessible, but the intention was to add features or to, or to promote something or to make it appeal to certain people. But because it was not, again, thoroughly, as Siobhan said, tested with different people, he missed, he missed that trick. So it's important that we design something accessible, but also we, we, we have a continuous kind of improvement record of, of accessibility, whereby we understand it might not work for everybody and we're gonna be welcoming feedback to say, you know what, if you're still experiencing this problem, come to us and let us know and, and, and et cetera, so we, we can change it.
100%, I think that's the importance of uh, product designers. Um, so yeah, it should be a continuous journey, um, a product or service, a website is never going to be perfect every, all the time, and it should be growing and evolving um, with the users. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, 100%. And I think it's also important for, you know, for people who, who are the owners of digital products to be able to ensure that they get feedback from users at all time and, mm -hmm. and, you know, throughout the use. So not just in testing, just as people use it to get feedback and to actually act on that feedback. And, you know, I would, I would suggest that all product owners should have, you know, whether they call it inclusive design or universal design or accessibility, they should have people who are concerned with that at all times and are continuously improving products with that in mind. Yeah. And also with testing, you know, I know for various business reasons, sometimes people are not able to specifically, you know, identify a disabled population to test with. And it stinks, but sometimes that's a business constraint. But the reality is that 20 per, about 20% of the population has some sort of disability even if you aren't purposely trying to recruit people with disabilities, you're gonna get some anyway, probably. If you're sensitive and you're looking for it, you know, obviously I would prefer that in a perfect world, we could always afford to pay disabled people to do the testing. But if you, like Sandy talked about, if you're looking at your customer feedback and if you're doing rigorous testing, on an iterative basis, you're going to notice those th things like low vision font sizes. You know, when WCAG did their 1 million web page audit, there was about six items that bubbled to the top out of all of those that were the most common web errors. And it was missing alt text, um, no meaningful links, things like that stuff that's really simple that can make a big difference or semantic, uh, semantic markup, like the, the order was incorrect. And if you're a developer, you know, would you write an outline one, four, five, six, you wouldn't do it any differently. If you're writing code, you don't skip headings, heading levels, you know, that sort of thing. Some of the stuff you, some of the really big rocks, if we each just kind of put our picked one and put our attention on it, it make a tsunami of difference for a lot, a lot of people. Yeah, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. I think there are like common issues that I, I think there's often a perception and perhaps rightly so, I don't know, but that accessibility is hard to do. And then that almost in a way stops businesses from doing it because it's like, well, this is going to be too hard and too expensive to do. And actually, there are simple, quick things that people mm. can do that actually would improve, massively improve the experience for a lot of people on their website that gets them some of that that way, that it's like the first step, right? That sometimes, you know, the hardest thing to do is make the first step. So like the things you've just listed there, I think are, are some of those good examples. I think going back to that point around, um, you know, di different types of disability and giving content to people in different ways, I think... Um, Sandy, Sandy, you kind of touched on this with having like an ongoing panel with people, but you could also just a simple thing is just having a way of people getting in touch with you. So if you've got, I don't know, an inaccessible PDF on your website, give away at the point where they reach that content, a way of them getting in touch with you to tell yeah. you that actually I need that in a different format. I'm, so. I'm seeing this more and more uh, when I'm looking for inspiration. I'm seeing companies ask, actively asking for feedback from users, and it's so important. Mm. Sorry, just jump in there. Sorry. No, no, it's no. great. Um, but, but it's also just, you know, bizarre that businesses are saying, oh, well, you know, it's too expensive to make things accessible. It's like, you know, it's too expensive to worry about 20% of your customers. It's just, it's, it's just you know, business basics. It's mm. bizarre to think that yeah. anybody's like, yeah, well, I've got 20% of my customers. I just don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. You know. Even if you took morality out of it, yeah, that's 20% of right? your profit. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I hope you care about people, yeah. but even if you don't, let me appeal to your bank account. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Save it's like 20% of your customers. People have money. People. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they think, oh, and what I was going to mention, I know we talked about this uh, with Daniel briefly, is... Um, 
with testing, there's a lot of people with disabilities who don't identify as disabled. And so that's why I was saying you will see different disabilities pop up just in regular, you know, user testing the, where you haven't purposely screened in people who identify as disabled. If you ask my mom if she was disabled, she would say no, but she has dyslexia. You know, there's a, for whatever reason, that stigma is still there and people are very reluctant to identify in that way, particularly with things like, and I think, you know, there was a time when I struggled with, am I disabled enough to claim the label? Or am I going to be some, like, am I going to get kicked out of the club? I don't know. I was like, do I, how do I qualify? Like, there's mm. no, there's nobody who says your, your, your hearing's bad enough, your movement's bad enough. Like, it's really, it's self identification and people identify in different ways. I say I'm disabled. Somebody else might say I have a disability. Yeah, Siobhan, I think that you, you, you could probably relate to that. As somebody with dyslexia, you, I think when we originally were discussing about this panel, <laughs> you said, I'm, I'm not sure if I... Yeah, I was absolutely, it's, it's, it's funny that you say this, Holly, because we had this exact uh, conversation when uh, Matt and Dan approached me about be becoming a panelist. I said, are you sure? I, I don't feel I'm disabled enough. <laughs> um, and it, but it does affect me. And, and like I said um, previously, growing up I avoided books I avoided reading and I love reading now um so yeah there, yeah definitely there is a stigma attached to am I am I disabled enough um I think also people are reluctant to apply the label to themselves mm. because they know the discrimination they're gonna be on the receiving end of for me it was less about that it was more what you were saying like am I disabled enough the good news is it's not a competition <laughs> Anybody can be in the club that just by self-identification. I'm declaring it. Hmm. I yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's why that's why it's important for those designers when they design new products um, is is to design to accommodate as wide as possible of different needs without necessarily mm. labeling it at the beginning as I'm designing for the visual impaired, I'm designing for uh somebody with dexterity uh you know it's, it's it's really no it's 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 about if you design something with kind of universal design into it built in kind of accessible understood and consumed by the widest variety of possible then this is a good start this is a good so you're building the foundation on that front and then slowly slowly you're merging and you know go into different specific group um, that might need extra adaptation, if that makes sense, based on yeah. their specific niche disability, so to speak. One, one of our audience has asked the question, I guess this is when you're being more intentional about making sure that you test with, with, um, with people with different disabilities. Where, where, do you, where sh should you go? Or do you have any suggestions for where, where to find testers? Who wants to come in there? Maybe you, Sandy? Well, I mean, I know, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's companies out there that do that. So there's actual companies that do website testing, website audit, that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I guess there's some companies that, 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 that do that specifically, but there's also lots of different charities. So it depends on whether you want to go to, we'll go to, you know, a company, an agency that does user testing and accessibility testing, and then they'll pick a panel for you, or you can, you know, go to um, different charities. So there's, you know, the UK and US, there's lots of different charities supporting people with different disabilities, and they invariably um, have access to lots of people. So it depends, I guess, on how you want to develop your user panel. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, some people may want to develop a panel of people who work with them all the time. So that, you know, and, and they've got a, 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 so I had a situation once where I had a panel of people and it was quite a large group of people. And I dipped in and out of that panel based on project needs. And so we had access to a whole bunch of people, but, you know, we spoke to them and said, okay, actually I need, you know, I need these particular people for this particular service. I want to test this aspect of it and so on. So I guess it depends on how much resource you have in terms of, you know, whether or not you want to throw money at it, whether or not you want to manage it yourself. 
Um, yeah. yeah, there's different ways, different ways of approaching it. But you know, the widest spectrum of people is possible. Looking across all the different types of disabilities, you, you you've got to really be able to to get people in different ends of the spectrum as well. Yeah, definitely. But, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't do a self plug for Cyberlook at this point. <laughs> we, <laughs> we we can recruit people and we do do accessibility audits and accessibility usability testing. So, uh, which um, I, I know we've only got ten minutes left, which brings me to a good point though with one of the questions in the q a which is um how do we encourage and convince our colleagues to to keep these suggestions in mind when creating content or on creating things um especially if you're if you're the person in the team that doesn't have complete control over that content does anybody have any thoughts about sort of you know getting getting that you know saying sort of selling the business case but sort of encouraging and convincing people to be more curious and actually be a bit more understanding of accessibility i would say to start with how much we coming in um have it have it from beginning having kind of accessibility in mind from beginning it really makes life of everybody easy so you wouldn't design something with potentially compromising on security or compromising on i don't know gdp uh, you know protection uh, the data protection you know you would you would you would make sure this is baked in into it. So accessibility has to be at the beginning. We say that while we are talking about the twenty percent of population who are identified as, as disabled, but then everybody could go through some some kind of situational temporary uh, disability. You know, and if you put it from beginning, you are saving about eighty percent of the cost that eventually you might have to cover it anyway, due to compliance or bad you know, um, branding reputation or loss of business or I don't know, you know, the upcoming, for example, European Spirit Act is coming into place and it will make it mandatory whether you like it or not. So having it from beginning as an essential requirement from beginning, step by step, just like you do security, just like you do the protection, just like you do other things, you have expect in mind and you understand that by doing that, I'm going to might spend a little bit more, 20, up to 20%, but I would be saving up to 80% if I don't later on. This is how um, I, would, I, would like, I, would like to, I would like to sell it, in, in my opinion. Anybody else might come in on that one? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, like, for example, if you've got, you know, you've developed, a, designed a website for, for say, Cyberdex designed a website for a client, they hand it over to the client and the client is creating content. So, you know, it's really about like advocacy and education. So you need to, they need to understand what the issues are and then you need to educate with them, them as how to get things right. So two examples that Holly gave earlier um, from, from, you know, the, the, uh, the, the WCAG million websites. Um, you know, I think that uh, if you think about, for example, alt text and link purpose, those are two things that are really simple to do badly. And so, you know, if, if you educate content creators, you educate people who are gonna be, who are gonna be populating a website or populating an app or whatever, um, mm -hmm. you know, and letting them understand the why. So the advocacy bit and the education is letting them understand, okay, and this is how you can do it, it's that simple. Um, you know, so things like training people how to, how to write great alt text uh, and, and training people how to write great link purpose, you know, use the great link purpose. Those things are pretty straightforward. And once people know how to do it, they just do it automatically. Cause I know that, at, you know, here at ENEI, we've now trained people how to do it. They just do it automatically. I mean, they're the best writers of link of, of particular alt text. I, I laugh at our alt text, it's so, it's so well done. So, yeah. you know, people get it, they understand it, they want to be part of it. Yeah, with the, with the link purpose thing, do you, do you mind sort of explaining that a little bit more? Uh, like sure, so it's the good old click here. So when you have, um, so for example, a screen reader user who may want to uh, navigate a website um, by just going through the links because they just want to see what the links are. If Every link you have says click here. All the screen reader user here is click here, click here, click here, click here. But if you actually want to say, uh, you know, check out uh, these fantastic offers on this blah, blah website, and that's what the, what the actual link says, a screen reader user hears that it's a link and actually has the, the what's going to happen when they click on the, the link described properly to them. So that's something that within the WCAG is called link purpose. Yeah. yeah, and if I just may add just very quickly up to this point, Sandy, making a brilliant point, this will not only help the uh, people who are visually impaired, but also actually yeah. make your search engine optimization is even better because yeah. that when, when you label your link properly, then when somebody is searching for information, they will be able to find your website or that links a lot quicker than if it only says click here, click here, click here. 
So yeah. Well. yeah, that's really interesting. Has there been improvements in this space? I, I, one thing that I, I've noticed, and I don't know if it's actually the opposite of improvement, is um, the, I guess it's partly due to the sort of digital transformation a lot of companies have been forced through in the last mm -hmm. few years, is you're seeing the more digitalization of physical spaces and certainly more touch screens being used. And I don't know, it, it, does that reduce accessibility? Uh, and also like, you know, self-service, you know, removing I don't think the it's equation. helping from my experience. I have, I went to a doctor appointment and I have to have labs done regularly. The lab was in the basement. The entire experience from beginning to end was inaccessible. There weren't, you know, the physical space was inaccessible. And then the only instruction once you reach the lab was a sign that didn't point to the kiosk that said, sign in here. And then on the TV, there was something playing for visually impaired and low vision patients, except it was so low, you would have probably tripped over 20 people before you got close enough to hear it. Um, it was a hot mess. I was like, we can't take humans out of everything. Mm -hmm. And so the person who had the unfortunate luck of sitting nearby, but was not actually affiliated with the lab, ended up assisting their, their patients all day long. And both times I've been there, I heard someone exclaim, I don't even have a computer at home. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. So I would say not super duper great for a lot of people. Um, in my opinion, um, I give example when I go to hotels, um, for example, or on airplanes, I get this very common touch screen um, to, you know, to put your entertainment on uh, the plane or to, uh, the airplane or to uh, get your air conditioning in the room or lighting, et cetera. And I think in, for somebody like myself, I'm completely out of the experience now. I've paid for an airplane, I've paid for a fare for the hotel, and I'm not able to get the same experience as someone else. I understand yeah. the idea of we want to make it convenient and really you know, optimize the experience, but all I'm asking for here is an alternative. Have you screen all day long? And I don't have issue with that because it might suit a lot of people, and a lot of people might find it beautiful and sexy. But I would like to have an, an alternative. I am expect an alternative from the service providers, um, be it um, uh, and a screen reader, um, be it a screen that, that, that navigates with, with talk, be it buttons, be it whatever it is. The idea for me is expecting alternatives to this digitization of, 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 of products that when it becomes inaccessible. Thanks, Yoli. I think we're, we're in the last couple of minutes now. So I guess to, to wrap up, going through each each of the panelists what would be your sort of number one practical recommendation or takeaway uh, for our audience from today's uh, webinar starting with you Siobhan because you're, you're first on my screen um I'd say I'd probably uh just echo testing uh user testing is so important I think so often it gets left till last and people don't budget for it they don't think it's a big deal and it is, it really, really is. Um, so that'd be my one takeaway. If you can get as many people as possible to test your product or service, always. Hmm. What about you, Sandy? Well, design with real human beings in mind and the widest variation of human mind. Yeah, I agree with that one. I, we didn't really get to touch on it, but the, the whole compliance versus usability things, I think yeah. so interesting. Um, Yoi? For me, I would say give as wide as possible op options as you can, right? You know, you go to a store, you find a door that opens manually, you find a door that revolves, you find a door that is, you know, I don't know, goes upside down, whatever it does. Give as many people of options in how to use your websites or, or digital products. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, you, Holly. Thank you. I think. You know, if you really want to make a difference, we can create tidal waves of change. If everybody just goes to that web aim, one million uh, 
homepage audit, pick one thing that looks interesting to you and start doing it. Just if everybody did that, you don't have to be Yoda or some sort of Jedi master at accessibility. The, none of us are going to run out of anything to learn. You know, like, I don't think there's, I, I don't like expert. I feel always feel reluctant because I know there's still a mountain of stuff that to learn and it's always changing. So don't worry about that. Just pick one thing and start doing it consistently. And then maybe teach a friend and that kind of, and I think people respond best to modeling behavior instead of being preached at. Mm. So for me at work, a lot of mine is a process of education. Mm. So I just casually drop in tidbits as I'm doing my report outs and provide the information. And then I demonstrate how we can do it better. People are much more likely to come over to your side if you're not in their face yelling at them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You, I don't Holly, like you said, that. <laughs> you, you said something brilliant in the last, I, I, I think it was you, you said something brilliant in the last webinar, which was that you might not be able to always be 100% accessible, but you can always be 100% intentional about trying to be more accessible. And I, I thought that was a really good sentiment in that you start somewhere, don't, don't just sort of mm -hmm. leave it. And I think that that's a nice way to, I think, finish, finish off the webinar. So first of all, I want to say thank you to our panelists. You've been absolutely brilliant. I haven't really had to do any work at all as a host because you're just so great. So thank you, Siobhan, Sandy, Yai, and Holly. You, you've been brilliant. Thank you to our, uh, our two BSL interpreters. And lastly, thank you to um, all of you in the audience for joining us for, the, for this webinar. I hope you found it interesting. I appreciate there's been a lot of chats going on in the, in, the, in the chat. I appreciate we've not managed to get through all of your questions. So like I said at the start, we'll, um, we will take a transcript of this chat and we'll try and come back to you with answers to the things that we've not been able to answer in, in, in this. So just want to say thank you, everyone, and, uh, and have a good evening. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. It's lovely. Thank you. Yes. Bye bye now.